In this video, we're going to discuss the organism Shigella. Shigella, um, there are numerous different species, which I'll show you in a minute, but um, the sickness or illness that's caused by organisms of the Shigella genus is known as Shigellosis. Um, all of the Shigella, regardless of which species we're talking about, are members of the Enterobacteriaceae family. So this is, you know, the same family that contains um, E. coli or Salmonella. And that's actually kind of helpful to keep in mind, particularly when thinking about Shigella, because um, EHEC, which is obviously a form of E. coli, a rather nasty form of E. coli that particularly in small children can lead to HUS, um, actually kind of stole its toxin from Shigella. Uh, it uses that Shiga toxin as a method of um, pathogenesis. So th this is one of those videos where if you've spent a lot of time on the Enterobacteriaceae videos or the E. coli video, this one is going to make a lot more sense. Um, if you watch this video and you're like, eh, I'm not really sure about it, you might go back to one of those two to kind of make heads or tails of the Enterobacteriaceae in general and particularly Shiga toxin, although I'll talk about it here as well. All right, so like I said, Shigella, there are several different species. I've listed a couple here. Probably um, the most important of the species is Shigella dysenteriae. Um, and that should tell you something, right? We're talking about a dysentery-like diarrhea. Um, so this is another one of those organisms that leads to a gastroenteritis and it's dysentery-like. So whenever you hear the term dysentery-like, you're thinking about blood, you're thinking about pus and all of those things present in the stool, okay? Um, it's an Enterobacteriaceae. Um, so that means it's going to follow the same kind of uh, descriptive tests as all of the other ones in this family. So it's a gram-negative rod, it's non-spore forming, it's catalase positive, oxidase negative. Um, remember that with our Enterobacteriaceae, we can grow them on McConkey agar. So remember, McConkey pretty much only grows gram-negative organisms. And then um, because it contains lactose, um, you can see whether or not um, different species are able to ferment the lactose. If they're able to ferment the lactose, they'll um, turn the agar red. If they are unable to ferment the lactose, it will stay kind of white or transluc translucent. Um, Shigella is not able to ferment lactose, so it's going to maintain that white translucent color. Um, I have a good um, picture of that in the Enterobacteriaceae video um, and also in your notes. So it's non-lactose fermenting. Um, it does have, because it's an Enterobacteriaceae, it ha does have that ECA antigen, that Enterobacteriaceae common antigen. It also has all those O antigen um, serogroups that we associate. And for Shigella, there's actually over 50 different O antigen serogroups. So this is one of those organisms that you might, um, if you're unlucky, experience it over and over again because there's different serogroups um, available. Um, all right, so we're the only reservoir. We are the only place that holds it, that has it, and therefore that can transmit it. And it's transmitted in a fecal oral route um, between patients. So what's the disease we're talking about? So I mentioned a dysentery-like diarrhea. Um, this is going to hit about one to three days after the patient ingests, remember, because we're talking about fecal oral, um, the bacteria. The patient's going to experience abdominal cramps, diarrhea, fever, and bloody stool, so blood in the stool. But there is actually a um, kind of cardinal feature associated with Shigella. Um, it's not just that we see you know, your standard dysentery-like condition. You're also going to see lower abdominal cramps and tenesmus. Um, this literally just means straining to defecate or having the urge to defecate, but not actually able to get the job done. So kind of a feeling of urgency that that needs to happen, straining to do so, and then not always being able to do so. Um, but when you do, um, uh, expect abundant pus, right? Because this is a bacterial infection, so we're going to have traffic of a lot of neutrophils, and when neutrophils die, they make pus, uh, and then blood in the stool, as I've mentioned. So why does this happen? How does this happen? Um, well, 
it happens in a couple of ways. First off, the pathogen itself is able to invade and replicate in cells lining the colon. Um, and I really do mean in. So um, these are so, this bacterial infection is a facultative anaerobe. So it's able to reside inside a phagocyte, okay? So if I have my pathogen in here and it gets in, and let's say at first it's in its little vacuole, it's actually able to lyse that vacuole and then replicate itself in the cytoplasm of the phagocyte. And then it can do something really cool. It can actually, it doesn't even need to leave the cell. It can kind of shoot its way through um, into an adjacent cell. So when it does that, it also avoids an, um, antibody detection because it never actually has to go extracellular in order to spread to another cell. Um, it also, like many of the Enterobacteriaceae, has a type 3 secretion system. I don't think we've really talked much about type 3 secretion systems. They're actually pretty cool. Um, it's like a natural syringe. So I've put a picture here. You definitely don't need to know all of this because this is very complicated. But really what I just wanted you to see was kind of the lower lock structure um, of a type 3 secretion system. So down here is the Shigella organism and up here is the target cell and this right here would be basically space between the two cells, right? So what happens is the Shigella has this syringe. So like if this right here is the needle and then this would kind of be like the collar that like you screw the needle into and this would be like the plunger and then whatever it's trying to send across so some sort of toxin or whatever so in this case like shiga toxin or um exotoxin or you know whatever else it's trying to get out and into that target cell it can just send down the needle so that it's just a cool thing um that this uh organism and many like it has. And this organism uses it to secrete four proteins into epithelial cells and macrophages that just make them more permissible. Um, the other thing, this is a highly inflammatory organism, which I think you could probably tell based on the amount of pus and blood that we expect to see with sugallosis. So it's known to actually increase the amount of IL-1 beta in the area, which is a very highly inflammatory cytokine. So those are all things that um, Shigella does or has, but the main thing that Shigella does and has is produce Shiga toxin. Um, and like I said, I, I went into this a good bit in the EHEC video. The other place you might um, check out is the E. coli EHEC um, sketchy medical video. I actually really like the way they explain it. Um, it, it it's just very clear and it makes it uh, it makes it very clear why Shiga and E. coli behave similarly. So if you're a sketchy medical fan, this might actually be a good way to review this content. Um, okay, so Shiga toxin is specifically produced by um, S. dysenteriae. S. dysenteriae, like I mentioned, can also produce an exotoxin. The Shiga toxin is an AB toxin. Um, we've talked about this a bit before. Um, specifically, uh, if you take classes with me, we talked about it when we talked about um, Bacillus anthracis, as well as some of the Clostridia. Um, but basically, an AB toxin means that you need both components. So the A component is your active component. This is the thing that actually does the cells harm, whereas the B component is the binding component, okay? So a toxin needs to be um, formed from both subunits. You have no effect without the active component, but you can't mediate that effect unless you can get into the cell, and you can't do that without the binding component. Um, so the end result of the Shiga toxin uh, is that it damages the intestinal epithelium, which leads to glomerular endothelial cell damage, and eventually can cause renal failure or um, HUS here. Um, so the A subunit for Shiga toxin, you have one subunit, one A subunit, I'm just going to make it here blue, for every um, Shiga toxin. And this A subunit is able to cleave the 28S rRNA in the 60S ribosomal subunit, and basically that disrupts protein synthesis. So it inhibits the ribosome from doing what it's supposed to do. In Shiga toxin, there's actually five B binding subunits. So this all together would be 
one shiga toxin, okay? So you have one A subunit for every five um, B subunits. The B subunit is going to be able to bind um, a host cell glycolipid known as GB3, which is actually pretty prevalent um, in the gastrointestinal tract. And that's one of the ways we're able to um, develop disease where we develop disease. I already mentioned that humans are the only reservoir for this, but this isn't an uncommon one. There are about um, half a million um, new cases of shiga toxin um, each year in the U.S. and about 90 million uh, worldwide. And it's, as I mentioned, it's pretty um, it's pretty unpleasant. Um, almost all of these cases, well, I guess not almost all, a significant majority, 60% of them occur in children under the age of 10. Um, kids are notorious for stomach bugs, and this is no different. Um, unlike EHEC, this one you actually can treat with antibiotic therapy, um, which I'm always a little surprised by because I know in kids under 10, we almost never treat EHEC with antibiotics. It really increases the likelihood of the child developing HUS. Um, the only way to avoid shiga and shigalosis in general is just by proper food handling and preparation. Um, good hygiene and proper food handling and clean water. These are basically the keys to avoiding gastroenteritis, which really makes sense when you think about it.